off we go hello everyone welcome to our webinar reinventing price research with implicit price intelligence this is actually the first webinar of a webinar series called agile insights tools and we are today two speakers first off here is Michael Schiesel. He is a founder and managing director of iSquare. It is a psychologically oriented, oriented internationally active market research institute with 74, I don't, don't know if it's still accurate, but around that, employees working on three con uh, continents and it's actually leading with a range of Im implicit research tools. My name Hi. is Frank. <laughs> Hi, Glad to hear Hi, you. Frank. you here. My name is Frank Buckler. I'm co-founder of Super Tools, which is an agile pricing testing platform established last year as a daughter of the Success Drivers Company, and it uh, leads with uh, exceptionally valid uh, research um, on pricing uh, intelligence. So um, yeah, Michael, I feel like, uh, maybe you can you like to lead in the topic a bit because uh, you are one of the pioneers uh, introducing implicit research to the market. Maybe you, when did you start with that? Twenty years ago or something? Mm -hmm. More than twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's my my pleasure um my pleasure to to start this uh, this workshop and uh, it's a discussion so if you might have questions uh, feel free to to raise them uh, everybody could could hear me hear me well um yeah my dearest frank thank you so much for setting up this wonderful partnership in this wonderful conference it's about a big thing, adding implicit towards the price research. Um, yeah, I wanna I wanna give you the background of implicit research, and I also wanna give you four numbers about the predictive power of implicit, or could be also called system one research. So you get now four numbers from me, from a more or less not non-industrial field and from the main field of, of our industry. Um, before I go in the main field of our, our industry, um, let me go back to where I first started to learn about the implicit. I was in the late 90s, uh, at Yale University, and I was studying with our dearest Mazarin Banashi. Um, she at that time was a professor for social psychology at that well reckoned Yale University. The basic problem of social psychology is and was how do we measure things which are controversial? For instance, social judgments. How do we really find out what are, well, prejudices? What do the, for instance, the nice students at Yale University really, really believe and think about this and that? So by already by the 80s, but then in the 90s, it dropped into social psychology. Reaction time measurement um, was dropping into the tool set of the, of the methodologies. And it was then widely used to assess, um, well, at that time called implicit attitudes. Um, Mazarin had a great tool called the implicit association test, which is about reaction time measurements. One of the ideas behind is that you don't only use the 
the kind of the thing people tell you on a rating scale, but you rather use the way how they interact. So the reaction time, how fast they are. In easy words, the faster people are in a way, the more, the bigger the likelihood is that they go into one or this direction. Um, together with, with Brian Nosek, who was a great programmer and a great stats guy, they were doing wild and big meter analyzes. If you want to read them, there's a lovely book called The Blind Spot Out. Um, in a nutshell, these big analyzes show that for social judgment, the predictive power to predict behavior with uh, system two scales, so system two is rating scales, the, the Mazarin also called it explicit, however you want to call it, something which could be really controlled is simply zero. There is no correlation between attitudinal scales and what people really do. There is simply no real correlation, which is a bit sad for, for empirical social science. The outcome of their meta-analysis for the system one scales, the reaction time based scales is, well, they had, they had predictive power. Uh, this predictive power is not 100%. So even the Yale psychologists weren't able to really predict 100% what people are doing, but it's above 30%. So much better than simply using the explicit scale. So this research from social cognition dropped into the questions we facing at I square, for instance. At I square, we are doing human experience research. We're also interested, for instance, in question, what is the impact of advertising on behavior? This field is called sales prediction. And here you get another two numbers, Greg. Yeah, that'd be. So if we go into the field of sales prediction, we were doing a lot with our dearest Jacques, Jacques Blachon, who was a mastermind in sales predictions. Um, we found that, well, not as in, in, in the little bit hot area of social cognition, um, the system too, the rating scales, well, they are somehow predictive. So for instance, if people watch a commercial and they say something on a rating scale, it's not zero to predict their sales behavior. From category to category, we found a little bit different patterns. Overall, we found maybe 40% predictive value. The implicit scales, like the reaction time measurement scales, they contribute another 40%. And a single, a single source of, of predictive power. So combining both measurements, you come up to 80% predictive power if it comes to, to sales predictions. So I'm very, very happy that together with, with Frank and, and with Wolfgang and with, with Supra Tools, we are now getting close to that highly important area of the, of the pricing research. Yeah, I think with pricing research, um, it's a very new area. So there are still a lot of companies out there who don't involve uh, human beings at all in their, in their pricing. They normally would go into competitive analysis. And some which are a little bit more advanced would use here and there some explicit scales. Um, I don't think it's wrong. But now, together with, with Frank and Wolfgang, we have the opportunity really to get better data and also to get data which are fulfilled with the predictive power of, of the implicit. And so that's really, really lovely for us. And with first clients like Centis, we got a very, very good, good feedback. We are integrating these tools in the Spark platform and let me also use this moment as an advertising moment. The Spark platform is a wonderful tool Iceberg has created also to include other indicators 
It's about an automatized, fast research. It has a direct panel access. And within hours, it could provide highly valid empirical data combining explicit and implicit scales, also providing data about perception. And that's how we, how we integrate that. Um, so that's I, what, what I wanted to tell you. I wanted to give you these four numbers. I repeat them. If you come to social judgment, explicit scales, zero predictive power, implicit 30%. If it comes to sales prediction, it's 40, 40. And we are very convinced. And with the first cases we've done also together with, with university, I was so happy that we also work together with the Ostwestfalia University. Um, Dr. Dr. Frank Buckler and, and I we are now going into that wonderful area of, of pricing. And I think it's, uh, it's highly important because prices are, are an important symbol in all our relations. And if we see pricing as a human symbol which has to do with relations, we could understand this field much better and create something which is maybe, well, more, more beautiful, uh, more, more true and better at the end of the day. And this I, I want to give over now to, to, to dearest Frank. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Or other questions. Wonderful, yeah. So all, uh, all of you, uh, you can use uh, the Q&A to put your question, the chat is more for um, interacting on the jaza, but put your Q and A question there, and we we will uh, either answer it right away or at the end. Cool. So yeah, the, also the Spark platform what you see here uh, is kind of the framework for our webinar series where we can touch point different areas of applications of implicit research. And today we'd like to focus on pricing research. Uh, so um, I like to, before I'm showing you uh, the method and, and, and the tool and, and cases, uh, the question you may have is uh, what's the problem with actual pricing research today? Yeah, because if there is no problem, we don't need some new tools, right? So and and this is basically what we found out uh, from the market, what, what the problems are. Uh, first thing is pricing research is very much expert owned, which means that not a lot of people can uh, actually yeah, draft a proper pricing research. Even when you go into a, a market research agency, there's typically maybe one guy one expert who who can do that right so and and uh if something is expert owned it costs a lot of money uh it takes time there's a bottleneck um and yeah it's slow it's expensive so if we you think of uh, how much uh conjoint studies can cost they can be quite pricely and what validation studies show they all those methods have still limited uh, validity towards uh, predicting real market outcomes so what um so basically what are the methods out there today and where's the where's the gap that's basically what you see here is basically typically three methods are uh are most most used ones, which is Van Westendorp, Garber Granger, or conjoint um, methods. And you can basically group them and either they are easy or not so easy to handle, yeah, expert required, or reliability. And that's basically how uh, typically people would judge them, right? So conjoint is judged as being reliable, as li at least more reliable than others. Van Westendorp is... I mean, it's easy to set up, but uh, many people have a hard time interpreting it. Uh, so it also needs experts. Um, so there is a gap. Yeah? And that's, we believe implicit pricing 
intelligence work fits in. It's uh, an elaborate method, but which is for the user and the outcome is, is very simple. And at the same time, it's highly reliable. And if something is simple, reliable, uh, has has a good, um, basically has low investment to, to do it, uh, it can be used in, in applications which have not been using pricing research before, right? So how how do we fill this gap? And yeah, um, Michael already said, of course, we want to untap or tap on the implicit knowledge, the implicit attitudes, the unconscious mind of, of people because buying decisions are, and also rationalization is guided by the gut instinct people have intuitively uh, when they are exposed to a product with a price. You you instinctly, instinctly have an opinion even though you haven't thought about it. And this guides your thinking process. So what are the methods? There are different methods of implicit research and the implicit association test, which Michael uh, already mentioned, is beautiful because you can do that online uh, with a few efforts. Um, yeah, so that's that makes it possible to have a method which is scalable and and fast and easy to use. So the the method we would like to show you today was first published by Stefan Schmidt uh, and and Philip Reiter, which is uh, also from I Square, um, and we at Success Driver took the the method a step further by introducing machine learning, uh, which we'll see later on. We use machine learning to calibrate some uh, some biases that uh, every research has. And that makes uh, the results r really robust. So it, in essence, implicit price intelligence, or we uh, call that uh, method is merging implicit association test on a pricing topic with artificial intelligence. And this uh, makes it uh, better, easier, faster, with fewer costs. Uh, and um, there have, have been a, a large study from the Ostfalia University, uh, and they combined all those four methods uh, they uh, looked whether or not the demand prediction is correlating with real market uh, sales. They also looked at whether or not um, real um, promotion uh, in the field that the method predicts well the sales uplift. And uh, the study looked at a face validity. And, and, all, and all those methods... Uh, the implicit price intelligence methods uh, had got the best rating. Yeah, it performed best. But this does not mean that you you don't need the other methods anymore. Instead, the study uh, concludes that uh, each has its role, right? So conjoint is typically interesting and usable for optimizing products and, and the features. Um, for Vestimo, is great for exploring the price range. Uh, uh, Gobble Granger is a is a quick uh, and easy to use and to interpret um, method, um, which which uh, has its role. But uh, of course, if um, if you bet you, the future of your your company or of your uh, expensive product launch to it. Uh, you probably want to use a method which is more reliable. And, and that's basically the implicit price intelligence method, which had um, basically by far the, the best uh, predictive power to real results. So let me show you the tool and some, and some case studies. Uh, maybe I'm sharing, uh, already sharing my screen. I'm, I'm going back to the, Tool. So basically, 
if you go to our website you can basically open uh, do you create your own account i have my own account here with lots of studies and uh basically uh, if you click here on this button you create a new survey right let me just uh, go through this sonos example so you add the category the project name the country you want to survey in and then basically you have uh the screener is just screening category users right and once you have that uh you're done it's set up uh then you add a product yeah you simply push here the blue uh, the green button uh it looks like that basically just two steps what's the name of the product what's the product description and that's basically on the right side what how the respondents are seeing uh are introduced to the product they have enough time to read what the product is about and when they're ready they go into a product test right in this implicit price and uh, price test which you see on the right so there is basically the product and the price and for each price the attribute here showing is altering so we have five different attributes you know, like appropriate fair and so forth and uh, the response is just reefed to answer yes or no but the important thing is the time they take to uh, decide right and after a, a price point the next price point is shown with attributes that takes um that are seven times five so 35 choice tasks so you are through uh, after a minute or, or two and um yeah and here you basically define your price range right so you set a a middle price point typically what you what you're expecting right let's say i don't know you're expecting 399 and you are saying hey i want to see uh basically steps bet between the different price points i want to test by 50 and that's how you defined your price range yeah so uh, we typically recommend that the highest price but it's it's uh max th three times the lowest price point uh but this this can vary depending on your on your targets so that's that's basically how you set it up it takes experienced users a few minutes right three minutes uh, and once you have set it up yeah you uh, and this uh basically the the survey is going to field depending on how many products you have it may take a day or two and then you get the you can look at the results and then the results you you get the demand curve which is a relative demand curve saying how how many percent of people would buy it ideally right and uh, it's uh, you see on the x axis the price and on the y x uh, the percentage how many would buy it right so typically if the price is higher fewer people will buy it but most interesting is uh, to know yeah, where's the optimal price. The optimal price is where the profit is maximized. Uh, you basically can set up uh, what what the costs to make it, the direct costs of the product. Uh, are taxes included in the price? So in Europe, it's included. So you have here in Germany 90%. And what's the typical uh, retail margin? Yeah, because you want to know what you as a brand gets from this cake right you set it up uh and that's and basically what's interesting is depending on the price code depending on how the costs are the the profit is of course very different because the optimum profit is always a trade off between selling less and earning higher margins so it's it's really nearly impossible to look at this chart and know where the optimum is you really need to have this kind of simulator uh, you can 
export the data or you can share this this deck to others. Uh, but that's that's basically it, right? So that's easy to set up, uh, an easy to interpret result, uh, but quite remarkable uh, case studies. And let me share you just a few of it. So we did that, that uh, with Rivella. You see it on the top, which is implicit price intelligence, and compared it with uh, Van Westendorp. Um, and the the product, which is a new product, right? Zero was very successfully introduced in the market. Uh, another uh, new product where was tested on uh, new potential buyers, and it was tested on people who tried the product. So basically, pe- product was tested shipped to people. So they are on a sampling platform. You try me, yeah. And the interesting p- part was to compare those. So before trial, actually the optimum price for people who haven't tried it is ninety nine cent. I mean, uh, it's uh, you could say, hey, the maximum price is at one thirty nine, but it's pretty much uh, the same. And if if the profit is the same, you want to go for volume, right? Because with the volume, with the trial, you increase the willingness to pay, which shows the next slide. Yeah, people who tried it, uh, yeah, are more likely to buy it, and the optimum price range is much higher, right? So, and with this insight, you can also really go into strategy and say, hey, we need to sample the product, we need to. Uh, but basically, when we introduce it, it's the the price should be more like a euro. Or when brands are more established in the market, you need to think of a way to long term get your one thirty nine euro. Um, another example of a dog food, um, which was typically priced as uh, a cost plus yeah so they had there are formulas which many even most uh, products are priced they have the, their costs uh, and put some margin on it and the margins they used were pretty low right because they just looked at the other margin and put it on and what we found is that Increasing the price will, of course, reduce sales, but not very much. Instead, the margin will triple. And this leads to the fact that they increased the price by six euro and made much more profits. Another example from an old Frank, meal. Yeah. Frank, we have a, we have a question here. Uh-huh. Um, some someone is asking um, does the tool work only to evaluate willingness to pay of products or is it possible to use it to measure the willingness to pay for services as well yeah indeed so it's basically everything every offering you can standardize basically which is a given right so there are products which are customized right so that's of of course not for this, but basically everything which is is a service, a software, whatever it is, if you can describe it, put a picture or logo or whatever to it, you can price it. Yeah, if it's a, if it has, has a price, and you can test different pricing models as well, right? So you can have a price per item, you can have a rental price, whatever your pricing model is, it's it's just a number which has a certain uh, price demand function. Okay. Uh, right, so the other example was oatmeal, uh, which was um, actually targeted to to launch for at 2.59. And yeah, the results show that going a little bit deeper, not 199, but 129, uh, there's a huge demand uplift, which uh, makes sense 
to go in with a lower price. Uh, and, and it increased uh, profits by more than 20%. Then we also tested um, products from very big brands because we thought, hey, a, a Volkswagen, they spend lots of money in market research because they can't afford to have a pricing fail, right? Because it's it costs billions to actually develop these products they cannot afford it right so we just ran it even something complicated like a like a car and it came up with exactly the same price point that uh they are they are sold today the same thing for paramount plus or here google pixel 7 it landed at the actual sales price we found out which was uh, very interesting to see that um, with a very low investment, that's why we call that democratization of pricing research, we can now get highly uh, valid results, which um, today would cost lots of money. Um, yeah, let me, let me wrap up and then we can go into more discussions. Um, um, so basically, my takeaway is combining implicit research with AI calibration enables easy and fast setup and execution, low costs, and leading validity. Uh, and I'm happy to go into more details. Michael, what would be your takeaway? Yeah, you you said it very, very good. Um, I mean, first of all, I think it's really our mission to bring pricing research to a different level. At the moment, it's a discipline which is in the hand of some, some super experts, and I believe they kind of have a vague understanding of, of what they are doing. Um, but we need to bring that to a broader human experience scale, meaning you need tools which you could set up easily and where you could access valid pricing information in a fast way. That's what I really like about the, the tool, that it's an easy setup and, and it's, well, it's valid. You, you, you repeated that a couple of times and um, I like to repeat it even more, more often. It helps you to get the consumer side. As said, um, we are pitching here in an area we, where we are mostly pitching also against a non-human experience approach, which is a pure competitor approach. So I know many companies who would say, well, our pricing, what can we do? All we can do is we watch the market and then we try to calibrate our prices towards the market. And um, this is a big blind spot because it's not like that. Because the, if you are as a human being, in a decision to buy something, you don't know the market. This is, uh, that's not true. You don't know all the market prices. You are in a, in, in a situation, you are in a relation, and this, um, this facilitates your willingness to, well, to pay something. And we often find that people have a higher willingness to, to pay for something. Why not? And it could be something very good that we saw with, with, with Centis, for instance, why not? And I'm also, as a consumer, I'm sometimes also willing to, to pay, you know, if everything is, is all right, if it fulfills my needs, if, if it fulfills values, then that's a great thing. Yeah, so, allow, so thanks for, yeah, for a... hearing, hearing my little preacher here, but that's a, that I, I like about the tool, it's the easy way of assessing these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good points, Michael. Um, I also um, collected some some Q and A's. Um, maybe I think we have five minutes to go through them. Uh, that are typical questions which pop up. 
Uh, so let me quickly go through them. Uh, why does API use causal machine learning? How does it work? So of course that doesn't fit in one sentence or two, but let me give you an example uh, with the biggest bias in all pricing research is that you show certain price points, right? Then the, the, um, the respondents see certain price points and uh because there is not a higher price point or lower price point in the research, it is already framing their thinking. So if you have a odd meal where, where you have from one to $2 uh, prices to be seen, uh, if you would have a $10 price in it for some reason or, or four, you would think $2 is, is very reasonable. So it's, uh, the price points you show are biasing all, all others and, and you cannot do anything about it. It's, uh, it's a typical effect. But with machine learning, we can now control that because we know uh, if a certain price point is the highest price point or the low, lowest price point. So in machine learning knows whether or not a willing to, to willingness to buy is caused by their reaction to it or by the price points itself. So machine learning can find it out. And in predicting, we can simulate that the uh, bias of the price points are not there anymore. So we can even control for other biasing factors. And we see uh, that this leads to much more robust and less uh, varying uh, price curves, which is quite important. What are the other, for which product domains does I IPA work and when does it, is it not useful? So indeed it's for every, every uh, standardized product. The question already was, was there. Um, of course, where does it not work? I mean, it's probably, probably less useful if you have a pure commodity because pure commodities are just governed by the price of other commodities. But as long as you have a, a brand and, and even, even uh, the household brands of, of retailers are a brand, yeah, uh, then it makes sense to, to apply it. Um, the, without considering competitive products, how can it ever be reliable? That's a that's an uh, often question that people may know conjoint and in this conjoint context there are different competitors uh, listed right uh, and then later in the simulation you have that that in but the interesting part is that actually conjoint also comes up with a, a um, utility value for a price point which is independent from the product and from the competitor. So it's an illusion that there is um, competitive, competitive related uh, optimal pricing in there. It's just because uh, you can simulate certain scenarios in the simulation later on. Instead, what you can think of is the price demand function that uh, implicit price intelligence comes up with is a relative um price demand function because there are many factors which influence sales not just the price yeah it depends on if you do promotion if you uh, if you do advertising uh if you if your distribution is great uh how where are you set up in the shelf how many competitors do you have in the, in the shelf and so forth so lots of factors but all those factors are just multipliers which means the optimum stays the same, right? So if a competitor have a better price, it it reduces the likelihood to buy for every price point, right? And that that's that's the beauty. It's so simple and still valid. So next, without uh, yeah, I, I will have more four minutes. Um, Without considering, without considering the context information, like the number of competitors, of shelf playing, and so forth, that's basically uh, what I'm discussed right now. How can I do 
a market simulation that's of course possible if you run this method plus run the competitors then you can take them uh into a price market simulation so we have there an excel template which you could use how can i consider the sales context yeah so in, uh, for instance i don't know a soft drink on uh in a supermarket costs different than an uh, an, uh, an airport and that's basically you can put it in the product description right so you can have say hey this is a product you find right now imagine you are an airport on a, even you could simulate a certain combat competitive price so you could put in a product description imagine the competitor right now costs one one euro what if the consumer don't have enough price knowledge that's also an interesting thing we believe people have always a price uh, implicit knowledge typically the price knowledge for nearly all products is pretty bad yeah if there are studies where people bought a butter or put it in a in a basket and they ask how much is it it was not very good what what they knew about the price instead uh still even though you don't know the price you have a feeling whether or not this price is is a good price or, or not a good price so I, if you if you if you come uh if you go to the car dealer and you have uh, have your car in the maintenance and you see your invoice seeing uh, there's a screw costing 500 bucks you have an opinion you say hey a screw cannot cost 500 bucks you are mad but you 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 don't have a price knowledge about it right but still the gut the implicit has an opinion uh so i i guess we are over time right now um hope this was uh this was useful if you have questions reach out to michael or, or myself so you can reach me at frank at zuba.tools uh, and hope to see you in our next uh serious webinar uh end of june look look out for that Michael, thanks for uh, being in in the call. And thanks, Brian. Uh, Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Butler. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Bleib noch ein bisschen da, oder? Als Lust. So.